Thank you very much, Michelle. And I certainly would like to thank the Old South Meeting House, the Bostonian Society, and all the sponsors uh, pulling this program together. And I'd especially like to thank the uh, organizing committee for uh, focusing on the Boston Harbor Islands for your series this spring. We think that's uh, really a terrific thing to do and, and, and very, very nice. I'd encourage you to take a look at the brochure to see some of the other topics that are coming up. This evening, we're going to be talking about one of the topics which uh, is very, very important to the Boston Harbor Islands and probably one that is not as well known to most people as it uh, really should be. Uh, certainly, my experience uh, coming into this position back in November of 96 uh, really opened my eyes to a whole topic having to do with Native American history here in Massachusetts and the Harbor Islands specifically. Um, I was embarrassed to say that uh, even though I had a history degree, uh, worked in New Jersey in some schools, other than the name of the King Philip's War, I was not even familiar with uh, what had happened up here. And uh, it certainly was an eye-opening experience, uh, to say the least. I hope you, most of you are familiar with the Harbor Islands. We just happen to have some brochures on the back table. And uh, basically, we still consider ourselves one of your nation's uh, newest national parks, uh, being established in 1996. And we talk about 34 islands spread over 50 square miles of Boston Harbor. And it really has a unique management structure. It's managed by a 13-member uh, partnership, which includes four agencies from the state, including uh, the Department of Environmental Management, Metropolitan District Commission, um, the MWRA, and Massport, two organizations from the City of Boston, uh, the BRA and the City of Boston Environment Department, two federal agencies with the National Park Service and the Coast Guard, two not-for-profits. We have the Island, uh, Thompson Island Outward Bound Education Center, and we have the uh, Island Alliance, which is our legislated not-for-profit business partner. And we also have a 28-member uh, advisory council, and that advisory council is made up of uh, 28 members from seven different segments of the community. And unlike other advisory councils that exist in the national park system, uh, this one has no sunset clause and actually has two members on the partnership. So maybe another night we'll talk about all of that. <laughs> uh, but over the last number of years, that partnership has come together and has created a general management plan to work on the islands over the next 20 years. And we certainly hope that you consider to uh, come out and, and visit with us. Separate from all of the management uh, that I just discussed, we have in the federal government an obligation to uh, work with uh, Native American tribes. Specifically in our legislation having to do with the Advisory Council, it talks about Native American interests. But above and beyond that, the National Park Service has federal regulations that require us to deal with specifically federally recognized tribes as we're developing management plans that have areas of uh, interest to Native Americans. Uh, the Boston Harbor Islands, to no one's surprise, hopefully, was uh, home to Native Americans for many thousands of years. Um, a number of uh, people have done research out there. Uh, Barbara Lutke, who was a rather well-known archaeologist uh, from uh, UMass Boston, really took that on as her special mission. And uh, she really uh, did a lot of research with others and found uh, evidence of thousands of years of occupation. Up until uh, recently, I was not even aware of uh, another major involvement, and that had to do with Deer Island and the internment period during the King Philip's War, and that's something that we're going to be talking about uh, this evening. I feel very fortunate and certainly thankful that uh, I'm joined tonight by uh, three of our partners. Uh, from uh, three different tribes here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, what I'm going to do is ask each of them to say hello and just uh, introduce themselves and which tribe that they're from. And I'm going to start at my far right, uh, mostly because she's one of my bosses. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> Edith uh, is uh, actually on the partnership as one of the 13 members representing the advisory council. And uh, she's an elder with the Wampanoag tribe at Aquina. Edith? Okay. Yes, again, I'm Edith Andrews, and I'm an elder. And I'm a member of the Aquina uh, Wampanoag tribe. And um, 
right now, I'm very pleased to be here and seeing so many wonderful faces because I think it's about time that people have learned about our, our contributions and our living in this area. It's very, very important to us because so many times people say, Wampanoag, what is that? And uh, we want to let you know that we are called the people of the First Light. Thank you. In your program, you'll know that there's a, a woman, Carol, who's the, listed as the uh, historian from the Nipmonk tribe. Unfortunately, Carol um, figured there's someplace better to go tonight. She's in Hawaii, uh -huh, right. <laughs> speaking of islands. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, Pat Garwood, uh, administrative assistant to the Tribal Council, has joined us uh, from the Nipmonk Nation. Pat. Thank you, George. Good evening. It's nice to see you all. See you smiling and I know you're all interested to hear what we have to say this evening. So without further ado, I'll turn it back to George. Thank you. And uh, then we also have not only from the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, but also the uh, executive director of the Commission on Indian Affairs here for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, someone who I certainly appreciate his uh, advice and counsel as we've established the advisory council and moved ahead on some of the planning, and uh, that's Jim Peters. Good evening, y'all. I'm glad to see you all here. And um, I'd just like to say it's been, um, I've been working with George and, and Edith and with the Harbor Islands for about three years as sort of an ex officio, and it's just been quite a broadening, um, an interesting opportunity to, to see what's going on. Um, I, I've done some research over the, the years, but it's, it's, I'm just thankful for some of the things that they have been trying to do in order to help us um, put our history across. What we're going to do as far as the program this evening, Jim is going to start with a PowerPoint presentation to set some context both about the tribes and some of the lands and the issues leading up and uh, continuing during the King Philip's War. And then we're going to really bounce it back and forth between the, uh, the three panelists. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the uh, relationship of Native Americans specifically to the King Philip's War as it's affected their various tribes. And then we'd like to, to get into more contemporary issues as well. Um, I think a lot of people are probably surprised to know that uh, there's a federally recognized tribe and about six other uh, state-recognized tribes here in the Commonwealth. And I think it might be interesting to talk about some contemporary issues, and then we'll leave some um, opportunity for some questions and answers, okay? Jim? Well, um, this, this is an interesting opportunity, and, and, I, and I find it um, kind of an, important to... It talks about starting at 1675, but it's sort of important for us to go back and take a look at what has happened, you know, to for us to get to this point. And, and it's just, we've been sort of um, on a learning curve for about 500 years trying to figure out um, what the Europeans are really about and, and you know, um, what their intentions were. And, and so we've been, we've been learning um, what their mindset was, was about when they first came here. And, and finding out about this first slide here, the uh, the... Pope's um, papal bull uh, declaring that um, that they had the, the giving permission to King Alfonso of uh, Portugal to capture, vanquish, and subdue all sacred, sacreds, pagans, and, and other enemies of Christ to take all their possessions and property to put them in perpetual slavery. Uh, their intentions of um, of spreading Christianity throughout the world um, it sort of um, found us at a somewhat of a disadvantage. Um, and as we all have known in our history books, we have found out in, um, that uh, Christopher Columbus discovered, um, some 40 years later, discovered uh, this hemisphere and, um, and began to educate us about uh, the, the Europeans' way of, of looking at things. And um, so from that education, we found, um, particularly us being on the coast, um, the, the uh, Wampanoag people uh, being on the coast, we um, met many people um, exploring our territory, um, the Verrazanos, the Champlains, the Gosnells, um, trying to find out who we were and what areas would be suitable for um, trade as well as colonization. Um, this particular map here is, is uh, one of the earlier maps that was um, drawn. We had people like uh, Captain John Smith who made his claim to fame down in, in uh, Jamestown, but uh, also was on our shores charting um, 
the the coast to find out uh, where there would be suitable places and um we had a lot of interaction um you know, they were mostly military type people um they were um taking things um probably more or less to survive or looking at the resources and so forth and and they also took some of our people to Europe so that they could see what the was on the other side of the big pond um so um then uh i think somewhere in between there uh, them and, and the the pilgrims um there were a lot of ships that came here and, and some of them were infested with disease uh, there was a lot of problem in europe at that time and um we lost a lot of people at that time and um as you see on this particular map there where the the tribal territories were um there was a lot of interaction between our folks um um in particular the the Poconoke and Wampanoag people at that time was um having quite a bit of competition with the Narragansetts who were just um, south of us um um a lot of us are intermarried um over the the eons and um and territory and, and different resources we fought about those um and took each other's people to you know uh, sort of expand the, the bloodline and so forth but um um there was a a particular period where we um uh, in around the 1617s or in that area that um our people were devastated by the disease and and uh, the the narrow cancer people were encroaching on our territory so um um we found it necessary um after the um the when the pilgrims came to our shores and um one of our people who was actually kidnapped he, he found his way back his name was uh Tisquantum you know uh, Squanto some of you probably heard about him he was from Patuxet which is now Plymouth and um and he came back and um actually he told him that there was gold over here in uh, Epino and they brought him back to um to these shores and when he got to the to his homeland he jumped off and swam ashore and they couldn't find him or the gold so but um um when to the next one that so we all know the story about him um helping the pilgrims coming to the pilgrims and help showing them how to plant corn and, and so forth with caring and and um he also was an advisor to to our massasoit usumiquin and um him having had the opportunity to see europe and see the power that they had the the weapons and so forth um he thought um and also knowing the situation of of the, our problem with the narragansett he saw that they would be um good people to ally with in order to um sort of push them back and um so the first treaty was uh, penned uh, by Massasoit and in um uh Miles Standish um in 1621 and that was about mutual aid um between uh, the colonists and the, the native peoples that so um and from that point um we saw our first treaty even though um you know for the majority of the folks who were involved in that didn't really understand the language or the people they were primarily going on the um advice of of Squanto who um who had, had spent a few years with the English um, as we talked about before it, the premise is that um if we weren't christianized the Christ, that we would um were well not even human for the most part and um and that they had the right to take what they wanted and they were doing that they were um displacing our people um taking some of the better parts of land uh, doing things like um deeds um and so forth uh, we always know we know about the um the Manhattan deal but we we had some of those too um a kettle and a hoe um where hundreds of acres of, of tracts were transferred um I have one little incident down in on the cape where where I'm from is um um what of us Achams signed this deed and um 10 years later he came back his people had taken him back to the english and said well we didn't know anything about these deeds and what they really meant um what is this about us not being able to use some of our our better places i mean uh, going back to these fine areas where um we had scallops and um other types of shellfish um, oysters and so forth that we can't have um access to anymore um uh, and that was in you know the 1740s uh, 1640s i mean um so there were some people in in Europe um some noblemen who saw, who knew their people and they knew what they were doing um and they felt um uh, for us and they established the propagation of the gospel um and part of that um 
so they sent preachers over here to convert us to Christianity. And um, they also realized that um, for them to really uh, take possession of this territory, that they needed to um, break the bond between the, the native people and their culture and convert them to um, that of European in order for them to, um, to really be able to um, take over this territory. And uh, this particular, so um, there were a number of, in, in the, particularly in the um, um, Massachusetts Bay Colony, there were a number of um, praying towns that were established. Um, I, I don't know if any of you would want to talk about the, your experiences with the praying towns at, at this time. Um, but So there, there were a number of praying towns that were established, and, and um, John Elliott was one of those. He was paid by the <laughs> propagation of the gospel in order to... Um, <laughs> And, and also it expanded, you know, to, to other parts of the Plymouth um, County uh, colony also um, established some praying towns, which isn't on this particular map. So, uh, Jim, in uh, Martha's Vineyard, where my family originates, we had what we call Christian Town. Mayhew was down there. And after John Eliot had uh, trans, uh, translated the Bible, which he thought that uh, by making one translation of the Algonquin, uh, it was going to suit all. Well, when they got to Martha's Vineyard, they found that they didn't understand it. It's just like any language. The further you away are away from the hub, the, the uh, endings and all of your uh, types of uh, speaking, uh, your translation is a little different. It's on the idea of having uh, going to, uh, even though we're all Algonquian people, and in Europe, you have the Latin-type people, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, French, Italian. But you can't go and speak to all of them in one tongue. You have to know their different dialects. And so they had to revert back to uh, translating the Bible again into our Wampanoag language on Martha's Vineyard. So, and, um, so that's what we have about uh, our language. And then we also had uh, three... Aquina, well, at that time was called Gay Head because uh, Gosnell took it upon himself to change our name to Gay Head instead of Aquina. And uh, because of our beautiful uh, multicolored clay cliffs that we have. And uh, we had uh, three ministers graduating from Harvard in 1665 that those were Aquina Wampanoag Indians that became ministers. I just want to add that the, uh, the propagation of the gospel loans, um, some of that money was expended on actually creating Harvard, um, along with Dartmouth and a couple other schools. We'll get to uh, the praying towns. In the 1630s, more than 21,000 uh, colonists arrived in Massachusetts Bay, which was a great strain on the resources and the land. And uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, Land ownership was alien to our people. Um, the Creator provided Mother Earth for everyone to live on and live with. It, it was alien to think that someone could own a piece of property and prevent other people from enjoying what the beauty of that property or the resources of that particular property. Uh, when the Reverend John Elliott arrived in approximately 1635, he traveled throughout the colony, throughout uh, Massachusetts Bay, and he studied the Massachusetts language. So he started in 1640 to visit the various tribes because he, his feeling was that the native people should be brought into the lifestyles of the English people. And um, so he thought that they, he could geographically bomb, bind people into one area, teach them the gospel, teach them the English ways, and he succeeded to some degree. Um, because he went around and he promised them and told them that it would be really great if they lived in towns. Well, it was great to some extent. However, 
it was very difficult for them to plant their gardens and to go out to um, shoot the game that they used for food because they had to stay within the bounds of that particular village. The general court did allow uh, a parcel of dedum, which is now called Natick, and that was the major praying town at that particular time. So it, they just conti uh, continued with the incursion and the Christianization of the natives by telling them and frightening them that if they did not believe in the English God, that they were doomed to damnation. Even though our native language was every much, I think there was a misunderstanding of our beliefs because they say we were savages and that we might have worshipped trees and rocks. Nothing could be further from the truth. We knew that there was, a, there was one God. You may call him God, we call him the creator. Manituo in Ewing Spirit. Great yes. Spirit was just Manitou. one uh, great spirit over us all. Mm -hmm. And that he is the one that put everything on this earth. Every tree, every rock, every blade of grass. We believe that you should revere what the great spirit has given you and to not take advantage and not ruin something so beautiful that the Creator would put here for our use. So it was very difficult for our ancestors to be bounded into a specific area. When uh, upon Massasoit's death, his son Wamsada succeeded him. And on Wamsada's death, met a comet known as King Philip, succeeded to the leadership. He was 24 years old in 1662. And he drew the line, so to speak, on the Christianization and the incursion of the English into native territories. And he went about, set about trying to form an alliance with the various English, uh, English native tribes in the area. And um, he did have a lot of support because a lot of the tribes just could not tolerate what was being done to their native brethren. But many of the chief sensations distrusted Philip because of his youth and they questioned his motives. However, he decided that he had had, let's put it bluntly, just about enough, and he was going to push back these settlers from the native lands. Well, there, there was a lot going on at the time, and as, he could, as Pat had talked about, um, there, there was a, a lot of conflict in the, between the cultures. Um, it was actually uh, a lot of issues about, it. well, who really ran the show? You know, we've been here for thousands of years, and you're going to come here and, and actually try to, um, well, try to take over our territory. And um, th this particular picture here is, is um, Wamsura. He was um, summoned to, to come to the uh, Plymouth Colony to talk to, to them about um, um, their establishing their allegiance with the with the English. And, um, and he was detained, and, um, and he was... Well, allegedly poisoned. He died very shortly after that, and um, and that was very upsetting. Um, and and, mm -hmm. um, and also um, after um, met a comet, um, King Philip, as they called him, was um, became the the Massasoit of the territory of the the Wampanoag people. Um, uh, he found himself in in a very compromising situations and. They played this game of uh, divide and conquer. You know, they had found people who would um, come and, and find out what was going on around the natives and then run to the English and tell them what was going on. And there was one person in particular, uh, John Sassamon, who was was going back to, to the English and telling them, you know, what was going on and, and telling them that the um, that King Philip was preparing to um, to wage war on, on the villages that were um, encroaching on their territories. and. Um, 
And uh, he um, found himself, well, they found him in the spring under the ice. And um, so the, the English were outraged by that, and they wanted some revenge. They wanted um, so that what they had done is they um, somehow identified two of um, Metacomet's lieutenants and, and accused them of, um, of killing him, and, and they captured those people and beheaded them. And that was um, about, um, the, well, the issue was, well, what right do you have to come in and interfere with our business? Um, if this person was creating treason uh, among our nations, you know, we have the right to deal with him, and uh, who are you to come in there and, and, and tell us otherwise, or even um, to um, impose yourselves upon us? And, um, and so the, I think that was probably the, uh, the straw that broke the back and, and the war began. Um, uh, Jim, would you, um, I would want to tell a little bit about John Sassman. John Sassman was a school teacher. He was educated and he taught not only Indian children, also the colonist children. So he was very well educated. He served as a secretary to uh, King Philip at the time. And of course he knew all the, uh, all the plans. So uh, upon knowing some of the history, I think he thought he was going to be an arbitrator, mediator, whatever might be, because knowing that the war was coming. But again, what, how Jim had uh, mentioned it, he was told, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, King Philip, Medicom, had ordered his death because of the fact that he was a traitor. The war was not supposed to have begun at that time because they were still in the planning stages, but he was keeping the English informed all the time. But again, I say that uh, I think maybe he thought he was a mediator, whatever it might be, but in our eyes, in the uh, Wampanoag eyes, he was a traitor, and his, uh, his death was uh, ordered. And they found his body at uh, Assawampsit, I think, if anyone is around Lakeville, the big uh, pond that's out there, that's where his body was found under the ice in Essawampsit. Yeah, it was just very bad timing. Um, our, our people lived in, the, in a cycle. I mean, everything happens in a cycle, and, um, and it was uh, we have to prepare for, um, for the seasons, and there are different um, resources that come to us um, at different times of the year, like the fish come up and you have to catch them and dry them and prepare them. Um, uh, there are other times, you know, when the planting season and, the, and those type of things. And so everything happens in a cycle. And um, in order to survive for the winter, you, you do things that way. And, and um, with this war being initiated so, so quickly, um, you know, before they were really prepared, they uh, developed different strategies about, um, um, and I, I suppose that's the way they, they actually fought was um, they were considered to be cowards that they hiding behind trees and, and fighting or attacking and disappearing and, and those type of things instead of standing there and fighting, you know, uh, face to face with um I think resistance. that was good guerrilla fighting that the people are learning <laughs> now that this is what you, I mean, I'm not going to stand out there and say, here I am. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, bows and arrows against uh, guns, you know, like, <laughs> guns, well, yeah. you know, we, we see that um, all the time, but, um, but no, nevertheless, um, there were a, a lot of skirmishes throughout the, the territories. Um. Well, while, while this war was taking place, uh, you have to know that the people in the praying town in Natick were not fighting. They were there. But, and they, um, the colonists just were afraid of them. They did not trust them. And so in uh, the general court in October of 1675 decreed that all Natick Indians be interred on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. And they were taken in chains. I can't see the yeah, picture as well. Pictures, it's not a very good picture. Yeah. But at the Native Post Office, there is a panorama of this picture. It is on the wall there in Natick. They were taken in chains. Oh, I'm sorry. They were taken in chains and manacles in to the waterfront. And there were 500 men, women, 
children, and elders. When they got there, the Reverend Elliot described the scene as they were patiently, humbly, and piously, without complaint, sailed on the downward tide at midnight from Watertown. They were placed in canoes at the, at the uh, harbor and sent out to Deer Island. Now, in King's Handbook of the Harbor Islands, 1888, it describes Deer Island as never a fairer sight found for a convict colony at the mouth of Boston Harbor. And I don't think that that, that was such a fair sight mm -hmm. to these 500 men, women, children, and elders being dumped off there on a piece of land that was one mile long and consisted of 184 acres. They had not time to gather any food, clothing, or whatsoever to help them in this internment. They had very little shelter because they, all they had were some thickets and the lee side where they could take cover from the winds the storms. Their only sustenance was some fish and clams. Some of the fish and clams were obviously spoiled and it caused a lot of illness throughout the colony. They had no herbs, no medicines, no blankets, no clothing with them, only what was on their back. And they had to sustain themselves through that winter. This was October when they went out there. There was much sickness and a lot of a heavy death toll. However, as the towns were being destroyed by the Indians, the provincials sent to Deer Island and asked for volunteers from the prisoners to serve as guides, spies, and soldiers. Many came forward, volunteered their services. They were armed, and they were sent to the front frontier, as they called it, to fight against their brethren. Over 400 of their brethren were killed through these skirmishes. Their entry into the colony, in support of the colonists, was very critical towards the colonies winning the war. In May of 1676, they finally realized that the Indians had indeed helped them to obtain victory. And so the general court said, told the Reverend Elliot and Daniel Gookin that they could bring the colonists, the um, Indians back to land from Deer Island at their own expense, however. I ask you, where were they going to be able to get the money to uh, get their way back? Well, as it were, that's one of the methods used to get Indian land. Okay, you were brought back from Deer Island, and you owe so much money. So any crops you have or any land that you own now becomes the property of the Crown to pay for your debts. So many people were cheated, as we say, of their land through these methods. Jim? Uh, this um, last one is just uh, to, as that was talking, um, um, it was actually a praying Indian that killed King Philip and uh, finally out in the swamps of, um, of his homeland in Bristol. what is now Rhode Island. Yeah. Bristol, 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 Rhode Island. Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, uh, not only that, uh, we had about 23 tribes that uh, helped us during the King Philip War. and. The, the people that had uh, um, 
been uh, summoned were, were the Narragansetts. And uh, history has all, in, as you read your history, you know that the Narragansetts were a people to respect because of their uh, ability to war. So we had, uh, uh, King Philip had asked them for some help. And then when they realized, when the Narragansetts realized that the English were playing games with them also, they sent 4,000 warriors to help in the King Philip War. And I think that was a great number along with all the other tribes that did help us. They had come from all over. We, our King Philip was way over in uh, New York State, up in um, Scattercoke, New York, which is up near uh, uh, Albany, searching for more people to help. But when I think that this war went on that long and we outwitted the English, because now you have to remember, we are traveling with women, children, elders, and all our families because we could not leave our families behind because if we left them, they would be murdered because at the same time, they learned a lesson because at the Great Swamp in Rhode Island where they had left a lot of women, children, and elders, the English just set fire to the stockade and murdered all of them. So that taught them a lesson of saying, when we move, our families go with us. And when you think that our children, elders and women and warriors had to move and traveled all over this Commonwealth and into New York State and up into Maine also and, and Vermont to gather all of their uh, allies. So uh, I feel that it was a great feat for our Wampanoag people and our other Indian brethren and, and allies to have fought that long before we were defeated. One of the um, things, Edith, just gave you an idea of the scale. Uh, imagine this, 1675, this war took that type of geography by people that were basically walking. Walking, uh, yes. Any or piece canoes. of burden yeah, would be carrying it. equipment. It wasn't an army on horseback. Um, some historians consider the King Philip's War one of the bloodiest wars in North America in, in once you consider the population of the Native Americans and the Europeans that were here at the time. So it was really a phenomenal piece. Yes. Um, one of the, I, ha I have to mention this. Some of the rangers here are going to laugh, but one of the praying villages uh, was Wampaset, which is now the town of Lowell or the city of Lowell, which is uh, where I worked for a while. Uh, that was one of the praying villages that was set up by Elliot, mm -hmm. and uh, they already got wind of what was happening on Deer Island, and they all went north up into Canada to mm -hmm. escape the, uh, the persecution. Yes. And the only, as far as we know, at least what mm -hmm. I know, the only written statement from Native Americans in paper having to do with the King Philip's War was a note that was left uh, up there that said, um, you know, no safety for us if we went to Deer Island. Oh, yes. And that was, uh, I, I think, a pretty telling statement. Um, as we understand it also, uh, besides Deer Island, once many people were brought out there, um, they probably moved some of the people to several of the other of the, the islands as well. Mm -hmm. They did. And um, we, know, we also believe that uh, over half the people that were brought out there perished uh, because of the elements and the lack of food and medicines and, and clothing. Um, I think it's a, to me, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to think uh, by a, a colony that was so based in, in their version of Christianity that they didn't translate that to the native people, yeah. and even people who had become Christian. So it's an, it's an interesting discussion and something that, uh, you know, something that we want to talk about. Um, one of the things that I also found was interesting in my own exploration and learning about the Boston Harbor Islands and its history was that all of this King Philip's War discussion was well known in Massachusetts up through the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, that uh, there was a lot of books, a lot of literature, a lot of lectures. Uh, there were plays, there were parades, there were monuments, there were all kinds of things. And yet, I don't know about yourselves, maybe because you're a self-selected audience of people interested in Massachusetts history, you might be more familiar with it. But when you talk to a lot of friends and neighbors, 
they just never heard of it, or they had no idea it happened, or if it did, they might have only heard about the glorified English version and not at all about the internment period. So I think it's a, it's a real important piece and certainly an important story uh, that we have to tell with the Boston Harbor Islands, that's for sure. I know we refer to uh, the, uh, the islands out there in the harbor, our first Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That's how we refer to that, because when you, when you think that they were brought out there with no food, no shelter, nothing at all, just brought out there to die with no help, because if they had tools and they had food, that they had seeds, well, we are people of nature. We would have been able to provide for ourselves. We would have been able to fish. And at, you know that the, the island's called Deer Island. It's only one reason, because there are a lot of deer out there. And also on the other islands, there were other, all kinds of animals that would ford out there, swim out there, to find safety for their breeding and the fish that would be swimming around there. We could have sustained ourselves very wonderfully if we were given some tools to work with. We weren't even allowed to make a fishing pole or a spear or whatever might be. And it's interesting how the English were very, very, uh, uh, you know, very careful. They kept very wonderful records on the people they Christianized. So in one way, I feel that the, uh, the Nipmuc are fortunate even though what happened to their people was horrendous, but they have names. For the rest of us that were non-Christian, traditional Indians, Indian warriors that went out there to try to protect our lands, they couldn't care less. Nobody was recorded, and they just died, and they were put in graves, or wh whichever way they, they buried them, who knows. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, uh, that's why you he keep hearing Deer Island and 500, there were thousands, thousands and thousands, because as I just stated earlier, the Narragansett sent 4,000 braves to help us. So already there are thousands. And then when you hear of the Delaware that had come up from the south to help us, the Stockbridge that are out there in Wisconsin now, they helped us. All of the other, uh, uh, um, the Abenaki, the Wabanaki, and, and the Penobscots, and the Passamaquoddies, and, and the Massachusetts that were left, that integrated with other tribes, the Nipmuc that were very, very good friends with uh, Usamequin, whom everyone knows as Massasoit. That's why King Philip went and tried to get them to help us because they were our good friends. They've always been on very good relations with the Wampanoag people. So there is so much in history that has been recorded. I have books in a bag here that uh, there was no place to display them, but you know, books that you could read and learn more about the King Philip War, mm -hmm. which is, uh, as George has said, that as far as some of the history books is that this was the bloodiest war that America has ever had mm -hmm. because of the population. Edith, I, I just mentioned that uh, at least a number of the people I talked to, and obviously I'm, I'm talking to the, you know, the European descendants, yes, yes, <laughs> the white yes. community about King Philip's War that really hasn't heard about it. Uh, is this war, and let me ask all three of you, is this something that's in the conscience of your tribes and, and this is something that's talked about? Yes. Absolutely. As you know, we have each year uh, in October, they do have the Deer Island um, reenactment at times. I remember that they did go down um, in canoes to reenact this several years ago. I. I want to say in 76, I believe it was in 1976, they had a reenactment where they set out in canoes and went to Deer Island and um, had a service there. Mm -hmm. so I know my nephew was in one of the canoes. I remember that distinctly, even I wasn't here at the time. Mm -hmm. But I think it, we need to point out that there were 500 um, people that were taken from Natick, but these were not, in Natick was a praying village, but there was no Natick tribe. There were Nipmuc Indians and other Indians 
as living in this praying village at Natick at the time, and they were also taken as prisoners. Of the 500 that went out that they speak about, the 500 that went out on that particular trip, only 200 returned. They were mainly women and elders. And um, Philip did go into Nipmuc territory. There was also a praying village at Hasanamisa and one at Shabana, well, we call it Shabana Gangamog, but Shabana Gangamog is what they okay. used to call it. We now call it Shabana Gangamog. There were praying villages there of Nipmuc people, of the two bands of Nipmuc people. However, they did give Philip a place to stay in, um, I think it's 1676. Yeah. He went over there and took uh, refuge for a short while and then he went on to uh, other battles from Nipmuc territory, went on further west and north into other battles. So the Nipmucs may not have, not all of them, joined in with King Philip. However, they did support him. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, that I also wanted to, to switch to, if we can, a little bit, is a little bit more contemporary issues. Um, obviously, uh, we've heard a lot about the King Philip's War specifically and the tribes that were here at the time, uh, but we're also talking about tribes that are here today. Mm -hmm. So, Edith, maybe if you could just start and, and talk about maybe where your tribal lands are and offices and how many members are in your tribe. Okay. First of all, I'd like to uh, say that um, we are the Wampanoag Nation. Jim is from the Mashpee at Cape Cod, and my family comes from Martha's Vineyard, but we're related because we... <laughs> You know, where you're on an island, you just don't stay. You know, you have a canoe and goes back and forth and all that. So uh, we, uh, we had a very, very vast ancestral homeland, which was from Plymouth and included all, e all of southeastern Massachusetts, both islands, Ma uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and we also had Cape Cod, and when I say southeastern Massachusetts. And, um, and we also had part of Rhode Island, King Philip lived in Bristol, Rhode Island, and his father, Usamequin, whom we call Massasoit, lived in uh, Barrington, which is Suwans, mm -hmm. in Rhode Island. So we had a, quite a bit of people in Rhode Island also. And what we used to uh, travel back and forth because of the, the vast uh, land that we did have to visit, and each one had their own sachem which would answer to the supreme sachem. And um, right now, we have been very lucky because we have achieved and we have achieved our federal recognition. That took a long time, and uh, we had to prove our genealogy and find and make sure that we had been a tribe and a government for over 100 years, and we were able to do that and our sister tribes have been doing that also, but there's always someone there trying to disprove a fact, and you have to keep going back, because we had to keep going back and forth, but we are lucky so far. We achieved our federal recognition in 1987, and then because of the fact that our name of the town of Gay Head in which our tribe originates from, well, it's really the whole island, but the, uh, uh, all the tribes are, that were on Martha's Vineyard either moved or were, died <laughs> or they moved up closer to Aquina, which the town is named now. And what we did do, because we had most of Chilmark, the English lived in Edgartown, Oak Bluffs, and Vineyard Haven. And most of Chilmark and Aquina was all ours. They kind of kept us at the one side of the island. But then when Chilmark became very uh, uh, populated, that's when they wanted some of that land. So right now, we have just the land of Aquina. And we did change it back legally uh, through legislation 
to Aquinnah, and we're very proud of that because we had always been a village. Right. And about, about how many members are in the tribe now? Well, we have not living on the island now because right. I live in Dartmouth. Right. I do not live on the island. Uh, we have about a thousand members. Okay. That's including children. Okay. Pat, how about? Well, more? the Nipmuc Nation has been diligently trying to achieve federal recognition for the past 30 years. We have had, we had a positive finding um, just prior to the inauguration of President Bush. On the Friday evening, as a matter of fact, I was in the office waiting for the phone call because I had been advised that the phone call was coming in from the BIA. And That's the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington. At 9, I guess it was 8.45, the phone call came and they said, well, you know, you've been granted federal recognition. Well, we hooped and hollered and cried and everything else. You know, it was a great day for us. The inauguration took place on Sunday. On Monday, mo Monday evening, while a council meeting was being held, we received a phone call from the Bureau of Indian Affairs again, telling us that Mr. Bush had decided that we were not to have federal recognition, that he was taking it under advisement. He called it a last minute decision of the Clinton administration. Well, the Clinton administration had not been in for 30 years, so I don't know how they could consider it a last minute decision. However, we're still waiting, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. They came back to us with a negative finding. Then we had to go through this, all of this, to answer every thing that they could throw at us in their negative finding, and now we are waiting for their final decision, which supposedly was to be to us in 60 days, which would make it the end of May. However, they always put a little, yeah. little caveat in there and say, however, there could be, uh, right. mm -hmm. you know. So the Nipmuc Nation, uh, currently we have two bands. We have the Shabana Gungamog Band and the Hastinamisit Band. We're approximately 1,000 people in both bands. And where are your offices located? We are lo uh, the the um, Shabana Gungamog Band is located, their offices are in Webster, Massachusetts, and the Hastinamisit Band, the offices are in Grafton, Massachusetts. We also have a reservation, just a small amount of land left to us in Grafton. Great. On uh, Brigham Hill Road. Okay. So, um, and our original house is there. So, if you're there, some, go through the area sometime. You can feel free to go up to 80 Brigham Hill Road and look at the land and the house that's yeah. there. And, Jim, Thank a little you. bit about the Mashpee tribe? Uh, well, it's just, geez, it's not enough time to really do it justice. Um, it, I, I just like to say that, um, you know, since, since this war, um, all of us have been. A new policy was put in place to deal with the Indians, which went from our coast throughout the, the rest of the country. And all the tribes have been, the native people have been put in, in certain situations, which was it's not um, something they haven't been in before. You know, our praying towns have been somewhat uh, reservations, some of the first reservations in the country. Um, Grafton, the whole town of Grafton was their reservation. Um, the whole town of Aquinnah was their reservation. The whole town of Mashpee was our reservation. Um, and and it is, it's kind of funny, even though things have happened on the books, um, you know, as far as we're concerned, nothing had changed um, growing up in my life. Um, the first white man became a selectman in 1976. Um, before that, it was all native run. Um, I think Aquinnah is probably still predominantly native run. Um, and not as much anymore. Not I think as we much have anymore. Just one. <laughs> but, but we only have three selectmen, so one yeah. is okay. 
So but we're, we're working on the rest. So just to say that, you know, for the, the most of my life, we were the predominant populations, at least the year-round populations in our community in, until um, probably 25, 30 years ago. Um, it went from um, 600 people to now we have probably 20,000 people who live the year-round um, on Cape Cod. Um, we are a, um, a case of the haves and have-nots in our particular community. Um, we are a lot, about 3 percent of the total population that are, who've been able to afford to stay there. Um, the, the values of the property have, have increased quite um, dramatically. And, and we, too, are pursuing federal recognition. In 1976, we filed the, a land claim suit for the return of our land. Um, we have a deed from our, our sachem from the 1600s. Um, and ratified by the, the King of England. Um, and we've been saying, um, if our deeds aren't any good, what good are your deeds? Um, so anyway, we went to court. We went before an all-white jury to determine whether we were a tribe to sue for our land, and they found in the negative for us. And um, we've been going through an administrative process for 30 years to um, have them to do the technical review of our actual history and our genealogy to, um, to have them to... Um, decide whether we are a tribe to um, to have government-to-government -government relations with the federal government. Um, we are right now in a situation of finding out um, whether we are going to be reviewed this year or whether we're going to wait for a couple of these. And I guess I'm confusing the issue in a sense is that we are there. They have a, a hierarchy of, um, of um, people who have submitted their applications to be reviewed under this administration process. And the, the NIPMUCs have been on there for about, what, six years on active consideration? Like active consideration. Um, we are waiting to get on active consideration, and we ended up suing to move ahead because we had waited six years, seven years now, um, to, uh, to get on active consideration. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were temporarily moved ahead last year, and the, um, the BIA got a, the Bureau of Indian Affairs got a stay on our, on our, for an appeal, um, which was actually reviewed last month and, um, well, actually March 21st, and they have 60 days to come up with a decision as to whether we're going to move ahead and they're going to make a determination whether we're a tribe or we're going to be put back in line, which we were third on the, the ready for active right. list. As you, as you heard, we're talking about thousands of years ago, we're talking about the 1670s, and we're talking about March of 03. <laughs> so very much uh, we're talking about contemporary issues. I'd um, like to maybe open it up uh, for just a couple of questions. If anybody has a, a question, we have a, a microphone here in the, the center, if you could please use that so that we get it uh, recorded. Please. What websites or website could we access to keep current with what's going on for all of you and the others? The question is what uh, websites might be available to gain uh, current information? Our website is Nipmuc Nation, and it's N-I-P-M-U-C-N-A-T-I-O-N. And that, that we do have a new website. It's under construction, but we do have a history on there and other information. Edith, do you know? Yes, and then we also have a website, but it's under Wampanoag. So if you look up Wampanoag Nation or Wampanoag People of the First Light, and uh, you will find that no doubt it would be uh, Aquina and Mashby also. Yeah, Mashby Wampanoag is our, uh, Mashby Wampanoag Tribe is our uh, website. And we have a website. <laughs> <laughs> BostonIslands.com. That's right. <laughs> Is there another question? Yes, sir. Is there any existing or planned memorial for what happened on Deer Island in the uh, Boston area? Funny you oh. should ask that. Why don't yeah. we use that to wrap it up? Uh, yes. Do you want me to go Well, back to we no, have a committee which is called the Deer Island Memorial Committee, and we have already chosen an artist, uh, a sculptor, that will be... Uh, designing a statue or a form out there on Deer Island that will represent all of our people that have been uh, interred or uh, died and some 
uh, some graves are not there. But we also, I, I don't want to, I, I would be remiss if I do not mention one of my committee members, the Chris Montgomery that's sitting in the audience. He's part of our committee. He's a NITMUC. The MWRA is Raise supporting. Raise your hand, Chris, so no, that they'll know. <laughs> the MWRA is supporting the development of the uh, memorial for the Native Americans, and there's also a tandem memorial for the Irish uh, famine victims that came there when that was when its history was the immigration station. Ma'am. Apologize for my accent. Uh, it's about the history you were telling the the war, King Philip War. You said when, you, when they put the Indian in Deer Island, uh, they were not, the Indians were not allowed to make tool. I, I still don't understand that. You know, tool for yes, fishing. And yes. How, how they could be forbidden for that? Because the people that were there with muskets to make sure they weren't, if there's a gun over your head, there's no way you could do uh, you know, naturally at night, no yeah. doubt you could be carving something out. But if something started growing, they but were just going to destroy it. Forbid it. Why, why they were forbid, forbidden? Why, uh, why because, it was, because they were they, out there just so they could just die. left to die. Ah, That's yes. what the whole, the whole premise was. You're out there. And when you think those first people that went there were friends of theirs, friends of the English. They were Christian Indians that were there. They didn't even fight. They were just gathered up from their village. You know, like friends like that. I don't need an enemy. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And uh, one more question. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't quite sure I understood the term praying village. Were there several of them, all of people that were, had been converted to Christianity? and There were, there were 14 praying villages by 1675. Okay, and why did they single out these people in Natick to make them go to Deer Island? Oh, because uh, at that particular time, they were not wanted in Natick. Dedham did not want that village there. So they kept saying that they could see that they were planning to do bad things. They were distrustful of them. They just would not trust them. They were afraid of them. So right. someone had the power. There was a, an edict by the general court to gather these people up to bring them out to the islands. And Natick happened to be the first village. And they were generally gathering all the Indians from these villages. And that's remember I mentioned that mm -hmm. Wamaset, those people left before they were gathered up. So it was a progression to bring them all out there. And then some of the yep. uh, ministers had already promised the people that were in those villages that uh, if they consented to help the English, that they would be given all the best, you know. They would be, <clears throat> excuse me, they would be able to come back to their village and live peacefully there, just like their counterparts of the English people. But that wasn't so. Right. No, it wasn't. And that way, it was a way of getting them out of the area. Because when you think, now these were yeah. peaceful people. That's why they were able to gather them up so, so easily, you know, because they were believing and the, the, uh, the government at that time uh, told them, we didn't promise you anything. Your minister promised you, and he's not part of the government. Yeah. So that's how that was left. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to certainly uh, thank you all for coming out this evening, but I certainly especially want to thank my friends up here, uh, Edith, uh, Pat, and Jim, for uh, spending your time with us. Uh, and Pat tells me she's actually retiring from the tribal business next week. Yes, so, she, so she's a short timer, but uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to put your thoughts together and coming this evening and sharing them with us. Well, I just couldn't tell my sister that she couldn't go to Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, very frankly, when she makes a commitment, you know, she really did bounce it around. Well, I made a commitment, but... The islands called her a there little you. bit more strongly yeah. than you did, and George. 
<laughs> Great. And also, Edith, um, you have some yes, material? Yes, and I have what we have, the uh, an aquinocultural trail, if anyone would like one. This is the, uh, um, the island there. That's one side. And then on the other side, there has history of Aquina that will bring you up to speed of what we've done and way back when uh, we, in the whaling days, because we have whaling captains, my great-great-grandfather was a whaling captain. He has, uh, he's down, his picture and every, uh, all the information is down there at the New Bedford Whaling M Museum. And uh, we were very lucky. We were part of what they call the, um, uh, with the Alaskans, the Hawaiians, and our Quina people. And uh, we all went up to Alaska, and they came down to visit us. So we have a connection of whaling. Yeah. Listen, thank you very much, and please help me. Thank you very much.